just a moment ago that you get an opportunity. Is there anyone who would like to share about five minutes worth of maybe something that God has done in your life this week? Anyone want to share? You don't have to, but here's a good opportunity. Something that God may have done or revealed to you this week. Uh, David and I get our opportunity every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday. No, we get a chance to talk, but you don't always get you want to share? Yes, ma'am. Well, it's nothing profound. Thank you, Major. Um, but I have been impressed this week that in the, just the bustle of life and all the things that come at you personally, maybe professionally for some of you, but just, and that God is the master, but God is the master and in control of each and every moment. And that I don't like, um, he's got the big picture, but I just need to be trusting for this moment and believe, you know, that he's got today. And um, and it helped me. It, it was just reassuring. It's something I do, but just reminds you that we don't need to get overwhelmed about what's out there because he's got that in each moment. Thank you, Carol. So um, someone might say, you don't know that well, but someone might say, well, if you give me a little time to think about it, I would have thought of something. Well, that's the point. We don't, we don't want a sermon. We just want an idea. Thank you, Carol, for sharing that idea. If you don't mind turning to Deuteronomy chapter 12, that's where we want to uh, start out with tonight. And the idea is that there is just one. Just one way to be saved. Just one way to obey God. Just one will. And uh, you could go on for eternity talking about the just ones. I remember when I was a child, um, younger at least, <laughs> uh, Billy Graham was on uh, the Johnny Carson show one night. This, you know, that doesn't happen, of course, he's not here anymore, but that kind of thing where they put a, um, an evangelist on television just would not happen in 2022, but it did then. And uh, Johnny Carson uh, sometimes would uh, say things he shouldn't say and do things he shouldn't do. But he thought, I believe, this night to put uh, Billy Graham on the horns of the dilemma. And he said, uh, you've probably been uh, lauded for a number of things. And he said, yeah. He said, you've probably been criticized for a number of things, too. And he said, would you share the one most consistent criticism of your life and ministry and Billy Graham said, yeah, that's easy. He said, it is the exclusiveness of the gospel. The idea that there is only one way to get to heaven. Amen. So with that in mind, would you stand? Let's read uh, Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 12. I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And it's a little wordy in this passage. So I'm going to slow down just a little bit to read it. Verse 5 says this. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all the tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and thither shall you come. And thither you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand, and your vows and your freewill offerings and the first things of your herds and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand uh, unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. You shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. In other words, things are changing now. They have a kind of a loose uh, idea of what they were supposed to do, but they're not supposed to do now from here on what they've done with their own eyes. For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice vows which you vow unto the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maidservants, and the Levite that is within your gates, 
For as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you, and we just come to pull that little section out of the scripture, and uh, if you want to read the verses before and the verses after, it might help, but that's where we're going to stop right there. Father, we pray and bless our understanding so that we could understand what we have read and understand the importance of it. I pray God you bless me as I preach and explain it and teach the word tonight. We pray God that um, you would give me words and an attitude which to preach and share the good news, the gospel, and uh, its beginnings even here in New Orleans. So they were to come to uh, one place uh, that was a uh, centralized uh, form of worship. Not many places, but one. And uh, it started with the tabernacle. Uh, and then it, it morphed from that into the uh, temple, that was a, a, a solid place that stayed in one place. They had the tabernacle because um, that's where they were at this time. They were sacrificed there. The priests were to minister there, just one place. And the tabernacle uh, was for their pilgrimage. It traveled with them. And as you remember, and I know you do, it was a tent. And so when God told them to move, they would strike uh, the uh, stakes, the, the, the boards, and all the cables and everything that held the tent up, and they would carry it with them. And I like to call it a mobile church. It just went with them wherever they went. But they were to, the, the difference, and this is important, the difference between them and all the gods that they were traveling in the middle of was that there was just one, just one place. And they would do everything all there together. God had a way, not only the tabernacle itself, but God had a way for the tabernacle to be constructed. Uh, I remember it's been several years ago now we did a study on Wednesday nights in the book of Exodus. Uh, God uh, drafted the, uh, the plan or the, the blueprint, so to speak, for the tabernacle. They were entering one end, not the, all four sides, but they were in one end and worked their way back towards the back because the tabernacle was a teaching tool. Uh, it was a visual aid, so to speak. There was an altar there, actually two altars. The altar of burnt offerings at the front and then the altar of incense as you went on back. There's a lamp on the right hand side as you progress this way. It's on the right hand side and there was incense in a particular place. And the idea was, this was God's way. God designed this. And uh, God has a design for just about everything. He has a design for mankind. We talk about this from time to time. I believe he has a design for the husband and the father. In the home, I believe he has a design for the wife uh, and the mother in the home as well. I believe he has a design for the way I'm supposed to do relationships, the way I'm not supposed to do relationships. But tonight, what I want us to focus on is the way they did worship was prescribed for them. Now, if I could fast forward and just tell you, uh, this is not a sermon about raising your hands or not raising your hands. It's not a sermon about... You know, some churches, they march around the sanctuary, and other churches, they don't. Some churches have a very, um, much more of a reverent and kind of a sober, kind of a quiet way to worship than others. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the way to worship in terms of making sacrifices, lighting the candle, and they had priests who did all these things. There were... Uh, the visuals of the sacrifices and the temple and the tabernacle were very important. They had um, they, so, some animals that would uh, drain the blood, and, and then there was the visual of the lambs being killed, goats being killed, doves being killed, etc., etc. But then there was, were oblations, which is a um, liquid sacrifice. They pour out oil, they pour out water, they pour out wine. It's a way to say, to say to God, we're pouring our lives before you. Even Jesus in the New Testament said, his, uh, they said about him that he was poured out before them. And that's the visual there. The visual of the incense, you know, when you read it in the book of Exodus, it just seems like, well, I guess that's, uh, and the, you know, the commentaries will say that's because they were killing all these animals and if they didn't do incense, it would really stink in the tabernacle. Well, I get that, and I suppose that's a good uh, rule of thumb to do with the tabernacle, but Revelation says that the incense was a symbol of the prayers of God's people. 
as they ascend. Isn't that, a, isn't that a cool visual to see the smoke go up like this? Some of us remember burning incense when we were in high school and college. Anybody here ever burn incense in high school and college? One brave, excuse me, two brave people <laughs> who were willing to say they burned incense. And you, you, you like that little stick, right? It looks like a, a sparkler, and you put it like this. And um, when the smoke starts, it goes up like this. It's the coolest looking thing in the world. And the, the, it's a visual in the Old Testament. It's a visual as that smoke ascended, it, and then Revelation interprets that for us. This is a symbol of the prayers of God's people that are ascending to heaven. And that incense, for the record, was supposed to be burnt 24-7 as a way of saying, pray without uh, It's a pretty cool uh, uh, visual there. It is that there's an order to it when you enter get the visual, and if we if we had the time, actually it would take more than one sermon, <laughs> if we had the time, they would enter, at, and the first thing that they came to as they entered the tabernacle was the altar, and as they made, um, they made sacrifice for their sins, then they were able to enter further and have the light, which light's always a symbol of the presence of the Lord, on this, this one hand. And the bread, on the other hand, the bread of life, which is a symbol or reminder of the manna that God had done. And then they proceed forward, and right in front of them is the second altar, which is the incense altar, and then the veil across this way, and the Holy of Holies is behind that. So, the sequence is important. You can't go to God unless sacrifice is made first. And that tabernacle was all about the approach to God, going to God. Mankind... Well, the record is always pondered and worried and wondered about the approach to God. How does man touch God? Wasn't it Michelangelo that drew the picture of the two fingers that touch like this? Wasn't that him that did that? And I love that picture, don't you? I need to bring that picture just to show you what I'm talking about. Because I'm looking at your face and you're not pulling up a picture. I can tell by looking at your face. I'll bring it and show it to you. And we'll find it there. Uh, in our day, this is a phrase that... Um, I have had thrown at me a lot of the times. There's a, there's more than one way to get to Atlanta, and there's more than one way to get to heaven. That's the idea behind this. But we believe in a God who is Lord of all, and He has made a way, a way, one way. And in the Old Testament, He made a tabernacle with one way of doing things. But you have to understand and remind yourself that they are in. A, an area and a time in their life where there are idols everywhere. And everybody is approaching their particular God slash gods in a, their own particular way. So all over the community and all over this area in which they were about to go into, Deuteronomy is just before they enter the promised land. And they're going to spread out. You know, the, the Judah is going to be here. Dan and his tribe is going to be there. Ephraim is going to be there. Manasseh will be over there. They'll be spread out, and so they won't be together like we are together. You know, we are spread out, but about as far as we spread out as St. Florine, you know. I'm, I come all the way from St. Florine. That's not very spread out at all. We get to see each other all the time, but all of the region there, there are all different kinds of religions <laughs> and all different kinds of nations and all different kinds of idols, and um, they have... Um, different principles to live by. Uh, they believed in gods that they had to feed. That sacrifice was literally feeding the, the God, and the God required this to be fed. They didn't get into very much the principle of sin and repentance like the Jews did, the Hebrew people did. And this was the beginning of all of that. So they lived by different principles. We live by a principle of love that, comes, that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. God loved us, not just in the New Testament, but he loved the Jews. Loved, actually, he loved all mankind and the Old Testament as well and approached us through the Jews there. But they didn't buy a principle of dominance. And for example, some of the idols were all about war and killing other people and expressing their dominance there. So I, I want you to see this one way. And then, then he said he's going to put his name in this place. 
uh, he would put it there. Instead of all other places, he's going to put it there. He narrows it down, which is an interesting way of doing things. He's not over there, not over there, not over there, not over there, all over um, in terms of worship, but they come to one place right there. That's important. Because when you get to Jesus, we can worship, um, but we worship through Jesus. Just one more. Just one. Um, I, I understand that everybody has different ideas, like you know, there's more than one way to get to Atlanta, but we worship in one person. Now, he's putting his name somewhere, implying that the presence of God was here. Versus all the other types of worship and all the other types of gods. And the whole idea of um, um, one God, one Lord, one Savior, that we take so for granted. And we're taught when we're in elementary school, in vacation Bible school, we taught that we're taught the one God idea. That was not the case in Jewish communities. It certainly was the case with the Jewish people, but in the larger community in which they lived, God said he would put his name on one place and on one people. Now, uh, that may sound um, a little exclusive, and it is in a way, but when you go back, you read that God would bless the Jews and bless the world through the Jews. His plan was larger than I think what the Jews took it for. The Jews said, well, you know, God likes us better than other people. No, that's not true at all anywhere in Scripture. But we see that in the New Testament more plainly. But even in the Old Testament, he used them to reach out to everyone. But he endorsed or identified with these people, which sounds just, like I said, a little strange of all us. We have, uh, if you put all these things together, this endorsement, the place of his name there, the place of his name in the place of worship, you, that you put all those things together, you get this idea. We have a God who is not up to there. We have a God who is there at the time. He is not far away, and not so far away that he can't be touched. He's right there at the time. And we can go there and seek his face. Jesus said, uh, my house will be called a house of prayer. That's seeking the face of God. He is willing to be touched by us, willing to be, um, you know, talked to by us. He is engaged with us. So back up a little bit. Let's think about this. He could have sat in heaven like this and watched the Jews and said, well, I hope you find me. I'm here, and I hope you find me. But he didn't do that. In fact, he established a way for them to find him. And that way uh, was through the, the, first of all, the fathers were the priests in the homes, but then that developed into the tabernacle, and it, here's the place that he put his name, and he, he did it out or gave or commanded, this is the way for we're seeking. That's important. You don't seek our God by killing your children. You don't sacrifice your children to this God. He is not pleased with that. He's pleased when we sacrifice a lamb when we sin. He's pleased when we bring an offering, which brings us to the next point, point number three, our gifts. They're to be brought there to this one place. Uh, as they came, they came with uh, gifts to worship him. And that's, there's another idea that's kind of in, uh, in that that I think is very important. They don't just go to their God to get something. They go to their God to give something. Their gifts, their tithes, their offerings, themselves. And for the record, even back then, the tithes and offerings were just an expression of their praise for him and their giving to him. And you get that idea in the scripture I quoted this morning. Don't, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they presented the lamb. New Testament, the lamb has been presented in Jesus Christ, and so they're presenting themselves. They're giving as much as they're 
get it. It speaks to how they came uh, uh, and how the attitude in which they came. They came with the attitude as they marched in and out of the tabernacle whenever they came, the festivals, uh, three times a year they had festivals. Um, but anyway, as they came, they came to give praise to him, and that was their attitude, not just to get something from God. Now, it is similar, it is similar to uh, approaching the king. Old Testament days, you never went before the king without a gift. Now, we have a similar pattern. Um, someone's having a party over their house, and we feel almost compelled to take some. Uh, ladies understand this, I think, better than men do. They'll call the, the hostess and they'll say, can I bring something? They want to help with that. But if you were approaching a king, even in England, you would go over and approach the king there. You're supposed to take something. It's a, it's a way of saying to the king that you are in subjection. You always go with the gift. When you approach the king, you always bow. Now, I don't understand these courtesies and these rules. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of us in here don't understand the courtesies and rules. If I were to approach the king, I'd have to go to school first to learn how to approach the king. There's always a decorum that kind of goes with that kind of thing. But it's important because here's why he's the king and you're not so when it comes to our lord there's a kind of a decorum that says he's the king and we're not and uh with the subjugated nation when they approach the king of this uh, the, the the presence of this new king they would take uh, gifts when the wise men came to jesus they brought gifts why because even though they were wise men slash kings, we three kings, you know, we learned that from the, the other Bible, the, the, the hymn book Bible. We three kings, you know, they brought gifts before them because they realized this is a king and this is the appropriate and the right thing to do. So, so it is on our approach to the Lord. And that's what it's all about. The house of God was to be a place to approach God, which fits very nicely just like this with the whole idea that the house of God is to be a place of prayer. We could say it this way. The house of God is to be a place of approach to God, making that approach. There is a, um, a parable that Jesus told about a Pharisee and a publican. You remember that one? The publican's off there in the corner beating himself on the chest. The Pharisee saying to God, God, Sure, I'm glad I'm not like that publican over there. Publican is a thief, basically. I'm not sure how he wound up in the house of God, but he did. Maybe he felt like he needed to be in the house of God. You know what that's all about, the story of the Pharisee and the publican? It's about the approach. How do you approach God? And better, and more importantly, how do you approach God in such a way that you're accepted by God? Well, you don't come like the Pharisee did, boasting. You come like the publican did, in all humility there. So that's the approach there of God. And that's what the tabernacle, and that's what the sacrifices are all about. It is this connection that uh, we said just a moment ago that we uh, see that artwork. Now, his people could come. God chose the Jews. God, God actually made the Jewish people. We say it that way. But God, there was a time when there were no Jews. God created, in a roundabout way, he created the Jewish nation by um, working with Abraham, of course, first, and then the Jews in the, in the uh, not the promised land, but when they were in slavery. So his people uh, understood this vehicle to approach him and for God to touch the world. They were a vehicle for God to speak to the world. How did God speak to the world in Old Testament times? I'll tell you how. Through the prophets. Who were they? Well, they were all Jews. How did God give his uh, principles out there? Through his spokesman. Moses was a spokesman. Samuel was a spokesman. All the writers and the, the people who who came, uh, wrote the um, Old Testament were spokesmen. Uh, I was studying yesterday in the book of Ezekiel, 
I got lost in the latter part of Ezekiel. Yesterday I thought I'd never get out of Ezekiel, but I finally got out, you know. But Ezekiel, <laughs> Ezekiel says again and again and again, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. And if you take that seriously and honestly, God is speaking to the Jews through Ezekiel. You see? And so God chose the Jews, but they were a vehicle to let the world know uh, not only about his laws, which is true, but about the Savior that was to come. We approach God with other people. Other idol worshiping nations would approach God individually. But God says, approach me here at this place, and there's a together element to it. It's not a solitary thing. When you're out there on the countryside, you know, obviously you pray to the Lord by yourself. But worshiping God has a communal aspect to it, a community. And I would just stop right here and just say this. You need this community. And I would say to those who are streaming with us, you need the community of the house of God. The people that are gathered here encourage one another. How do they do it? I got a good answer. I don't know. But I know that they do it. When I see you walk in on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, it makes me smile. Why? I don't know. There's another good answer. I don't know. But I know it's true. I'll tell you this one thing. When I see others that I know uh, and you know, get to know people at church, when I see others that I know, this is how I feel on an emotional level. I feel like I'm not alone. I'm trying to follow God, but I'm looking around at this crowd here tonight, and everybody here is trying to do that very same thing. Are we good at it? Sometimes not. Sometimes we're not good at following the Lord, but that's another reason why we need one another. And one of the worst things about COVID, if I could get off on COVID one more time, one of the worst things about COVID is it has divided us. We have not been able to encourage one another like we normally would. Television is a, is a good thing, for worshiping, but it's really not adequate. There's this communal, uh, uh, community thing, which I believe God had in mind all along. They had community feasts. Here are three. Passover, Pentecost, Booths. Passover celebrated their deliverance from Egypt. Pentecost celebrated the, the harvest that God gave them. The Booths celebrated the fact that as they wandered, God was with them all along. They got together. This is Leviticus 23. If you need to go back there and find the festivals and whatnot. Now, whose idea were those three festivals? God's idea. Why did God come up with those three festivals? To help in all three of those areas right there. Because God knew that people needed this. You need the house of God. You need the people of God. You need to worship in this particular way. All together in relationship with him and also in relation, excuse me, relationship with one another. I am not following Jesus by myself. You know, I don't know if you ever sing that song that used to be on Hee Haw, Gloom, Despair, and Agony. This is my inspiration song. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. I'm all alone. I'm the only one that's serving you. You know what that is? That's a lie. God told Elijah in Elijah 19, he was not the only one serving the Lord. But I, you know what I'm about to say. Sometimes it feels that way. We need one another. So it's supposed to be a with people thing. It's a people thing. And it's a grouped people thing. And then we're supposed to worship with joy. There's an element of joy that's mentioned even here. Uh, not so somber and so sad that we rule out joy, but simply joy. It is, I think, a demeanor or an attitude that we should have as we come. Um, don't let this go to your head. But I had a friend of mine who came and worshipped with us once. 
Memphis, and he left the church that morning, and, and he and I talked that next week, and he said, that's a happy church. That's a good thing, that we're a happy church. Are we perfect? No, but we're happy in perfect. Right? It's a happy church. And then he said, if you go to such and such church, and he named the church, he said, it's like they've got cancer or something at that church. It is not a happy church. We worship the Lord with joy because when we focus on Him, we've got something to be happy about. Amen. Our sins are forgiven. We're not traveling this lonely road by ourselves. It is not gloom, despair, and agony on me. We do have moments of gloom and despair and agony on me, but overall, it's a happy thing. Uh, the psalmist said it this way. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Even then, in the psalmist's day, it was supposed to be a, a glad thing. Now, just one. Just one place of worship. Just one way to worship that includes that attitude that we just mentioned while ago. Bring these sacrifices for this. These sacrifices for that. Put the visual of the lampstand here. Put the visual of the incense table there. Put the curtain up to hide the Holy of Holies there. Do you know why? Because every bit of that speaks to Jesus. Think about it. He is the sacrifice as you enter the tabernacle who takes away the sin of the world. Think about it. He is on the right hand side. The light of the world. There was it was a menorah with seven branches. Seven's the perfect number. They could have made it a hundred branches, I guess, but it was seven. On the left hand side, there's the bread. He is the bread of life, who sustains us, who feeds us right. And in front, he is the altar of incense, who prays for us and with us continually, just one. So, two ideas, and we're done. On the ark, as we have talked about more than once, there was just one door. And when the people of God, that would be Noah and family, got on board, God shut the door. Not the doors, but he shut the door. There was a way, but listen, there was just one way. And I would, before I leave the ark, let me remind you of something. It was God's idea to come up with the ark. He knew he was about to destroy the world, and he made a way. He made a way that anybody who wanted to could be saved, to use a contemporary word, saved from the flood. And then we fast forward all the way across the Old Testament. That's Genesis 6 all across the Old Testament to Matthew 1, and we get the Savior, Jesus. And he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Just one. But it's a good one. <laughs> it's all we need. There's only one way. It has always been that way. And when God established this one way in Deuteronomy through Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy there, when God established that way, he knew all of what we talked about. And this was not only the right thing to do, but the best thing, not just for Moses, but for all of his people. This is good. This is right for them to get together and to love each other and to support each other. You and I are saved one way. We're not saved the Jerry way, or excuse me for using you as an example, Wesley, the Wesley way. It's not the Wesley way, and it's not the Jerry way. It's the Jesus way. Amen. The Jews were not saved in the Jews way. The Gentiles were not saved in the Gentile way. You got Jews over here, Gentiles over here. God created another way. And all Gentiles have to be saved this way. All Jews have to be saved this way. But I would say this one more time. 
It was God's idea to provide a way, and so he made an ark through Noah. He made an ark. He made a way of worship in Deuteronomy. And in the New Testament, which we are under, he's made a way. A way so that we can receive the light of the world, just like the tabernacle. A way to get to the back of the tabernacle, uh, which is the, the Holy of Holies. How do we get to God? I'll tell you how we get to God. Through the Jesus way. How do we find nourishment? Through the Jesus way of the bread that was there at the tabernacle. How do we get our sins forgiven? Through the Jesus way of the sacrifice being made. How do we touch God? We got prayer. There is but one way. Through Jesus Christ. He made a way. And he intercedes. Your prayers cannot get through on your merits. I hate to tell you this. You're just not good enough. But Jesus is. And, a little secret, he made a way. Father, I'm thankful to you that not only do you teach us this in the New Testament, but you teach us this in the Old Testament. It is exclusive. As uh, Johnny Carson and Billy Graham talked about, but it is true. It is good. It is right. And you made a way. Thank you, God, for Jesus Christ, your Savior, and our Savior, who opened up the floodgates of heaven so that all may win. Thank you for Jesus. Help us, Lord, to never forget that Jesus Christ.